guys how are you i think we are back can you guys hear me can you guys see me give me a thumbs up good just wanted to make sure okay So let's see who's here. Uh, all right, Perla's not there. Jane, I see you. Lena, Chad, see you. Heather, Moses is not there. Avenu is not there. Talia is not there. Sarah in the corner. Stephen, Carlos, Luz, Flavio, Meredith, I see you. Catherine, I see you, and you got company. <laughs> uh, Joseph. Natalie, Nicole, Gary, Gil, Brian, uh, Vanessa, Sabrina, Yanessa, who else? Anthony, Riley, Emily walking around. David Gonzalez is kind of stationary. Geraldine, um, don't, don't give me that face. You were just in, you were in the house, then you go in the car, and then you're like, you guys all over the place. Anyway, Geraldine, Peter, Mina, I see you. Mina, Yusef, Mina Fawzi, I don't see you. All right, cool. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. We're good. All right. So let's see what we got. Uh, three approaches to values. So what are approaches to values? How to figure out value, okay? So when we say three approaches is how to figure out value. So Jane just sent me, sent us a message. Gentrification in Newark, consider progression. So yeah. Uh, Everything that's happening to Newark right now is considered progression. That's why it increases the value as well. Absolutely. Which is a good thing and it's a bad thing. Gentrification is good and bad. But anyway, that's a different story, not for today. Um, so three approaches to value. The first two are, uh, the first one is very easy to understand because we've, we've talked about it already so many times. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, which is a sales comparison approach. Now, sales comparison approach, comps, right? If you ever hear it, it's comps or also called uh, CMA, okay? So sales comparison approach, CMA or comps mean the same. And the sales comparison approach is essential in almost every appraisal of real estate. It's also considered the most reliable of the three um approaches in appraising residential property so comps are traditional for residential why because you don't have many amenities and we'll talk about that in a second now a sales comparison approach could also be called market data approach why because it's based on what the market is doing we're going to see how many properties uh, sold and how much they sold for if they're similar if they're not so it's based on market data Okay, so sales comparison approach, also known as market data. Now, this is where we do an estimate of value by comparing the subject property, which is the one under appraisal, with recently sold similar properties. Recently sold similar properties, okay? So sales comparison approach or market data approach is where we're looking at other properties are alike and they sold recently. So right here on top, comparables or comps. This approach is most often used by brokers and salespeople. This is the most common for everybody, but most commonly used by us. 
when we help a seller set the price for residential real estate. Okay. Notice what it says right after. It says in an active market. Why active market? Because it's based on, again, comparable sales, right? So there has to be an active market for us to have sales so we can compare them to. Simple. Now, because no two parts of real estate are exactly alike, each comparable property must be compared with the subject property and the sales price adjusted for the similar features. But I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Now, the principal factors for which adjustments must be made fall into four basic categories. What are these categories? The first one is date of sale. And the second one is location. To me, these are the most important to understand. Everything else is common sense. And I think these two are common sense as well, but I just want to give you a few pointers here. The date of sale is simple. I'm trying to compare a property for sale today. Should I compare with properties that sold five years ago? Let me know in the chat. Of course not. It doesn't make sense. It's a different type of market nowadays, right? So it's very simple. What I want you guys to understand is that we're going to compare to recent sales, just like Mina Yusef just wrote, recent sales. You want to try to be within 90 to 180 days. By the way, this is not for state exam. It's just for you guys to know. Um, always look at uh, three to six months the most because that's the most active market. If you don't have sales in that particular uh, area that are within six months, then we need to use other approaches. Okay? Active market would be 90 to 180 days. The volume of sales in the past three to six months. As far as location, can I compare, I'm in Newark, can I compare a single family, three bedroom, two bath in the middle of the ironbound section to a property, single family, three bedroom, two bath down in Trenton? Can I compare? Why not? Because again, it's different markets. So you want to try to be, um, you want to try to be within half to one mile radius, okay? So half mile to one mile radius. And also you need to pay attention to um, neighborhoods, even within the same neighborhood. Certain locations are des more desirable than others, right? So even though you're going half mile to one mile, you might now be, you see how this hand is missing here? When you go half mile to one mile, it, one mile is not much, but now you're in a different town. It doesn't even show up on the screen. You see that? Same thing. You got to look at neighborhood to neighborhood. Within the same town, there's different neighborhoods, different type of criteria within the same town. Here in Newark, we have like four or five different locations that have their own independent value, even though it's in the same town. Does that make sense? So we have the Ironbound section. We have the Forest Hill section. We have... Uh, so th all these different sections have different values and they're all within half mile to one mile radius from each other sometimes right so you have to be very careful with that next physical features Th this one's common sense you're going to compare apples to apples so if it's a single family compare it to single families if it has three bathroom compare it to three bathroom if it has two uh three bedroom three bedroom two bathroom two bathroom if it has a garage garage all right but is it possible that we're going to find that many comparables that are very alike, like twins almost? No. Some might have one bathroom. Some might have no garage. But we need to get to as close as we can to the subject property. Those are the physical features that we're going to try to narrow down as much as we can to the subject property that's under appraisal. Just like the terms and conditions, they always also change the value of a, of a property. If it was sold cash, then do you think it was sold for a higher price or a lesser price? Most likely a lesser price, right? If it was financed, most likely a higher price. So we have to consider these as well. Was it a foreclosure, a short sale? How, was this, how did the sale happen when you go do the comparables, okay? 
after careful analysis, very important, after careful analysis, you have to adjust for the differences. And these differences, you're going to assign a dollar value. Because remember, we might not have that many sales within the past three to six months in certain areas. So we have to adjust or expand our search. We might not have within half mile to one mile. So we might have to adjust or expand our search. We might not have three bedroom, two bath. We have three bedroom, one. Or we have four bedroom, two. And we have to then adjust for these differences. If there's a garage, maybe it's worth $5,000 more. If there's no garage, it's $5,000 less, as an example. All right? In certain areas, different values. So don't quote me on the 5000 It depends on the area that you live. But these differences have to be adjusted accordingly. Okay? And here you have an example of that. This is an example appraisal summary. Okay. And it talks about the subject property. So let's say this is the one we're trying to sell, 120 um, James Street. Okay. This is the one we're trying to sell. And we're comparing to property A, which is very close by on uh, Adams Avenue, right? This one is called Back Road. So this is like 83. This is two Back Road. This is uh, 113, and we say it's going to be something uh, uh, close by. We're going to call it Camden Street. Okay, let's say these are all close by. This is what they've sold for, and these are the differences when compared to the subject property. This is poorer, or the subject property is poorer, so they increase value. This one, subject property is larger, so it decreases the value of this appraisal and so on. So we make these adjustments and if you look at, at the end there's something called net adjustments. Right? So this is the subject property that we're trying to figure out value. We have nothing there. But when we go compare to the other properties, property A is worth 259, property B is worth 263, property C uh, is worth 254,000. Okay? So these are the values of these properties after these adjustments, after these comparables. So we know that this property is most likely worth, let's say, 258,000 is the value of this property after knowing these adjustments. So we're gonna say 258,000 is the value of this property. It's based on the average of these sales. You guys got it? Any questions? This is not essential, by the way. It's not essential right now for exam for you to have understand the concept, it is essential. Understanding how much do we change, it's not because it varies from market to market. Okay, and then Gary's asking, is this inf information on the MLS? And then as a realtor, do you do the comparables? Absolutely, so most likely we're doing based on uh, an MLS that we have access to and that's the listing you're trying to get. So then you're gonna compare to properties that are in the area that are listed on the MLS. Properties that have recently sold, so all sales are on the MLS. So if I'm in Newark, I use Garden State MLS, for instance, that's where I'm gonna do my comps. Now, unfortunately, because there's more than one MLS that cover Newark, we might have to look at comps that are also on that MLS. Uh, so there's different rules for every MLS. Let, let me just put it out there. I think I've mentioned before. Um, so, there's NJMLS as an example. Um, if, if you list on, let's say your brokerage, your brokerage uh, has NJMLS and GSMLS, but you as an agent only have GSMLS. What are you gonna do? You're gonna list that property on GSMLS because that's what you as an agent 
have access to. That's what you paid for. Because your broker is part of NJMLS as well, NJMLS has a rule, and I'm just giving you an example because other MLSs are, uh, have similar rules to this. G, uh, NJMLS says, if you're listing in a different MLS, but in an area that we cover, then you have to list it here as well, okay? So what sometimes some brokers do is, well, if it's on NJMLS and they force GSMLS people to list here, then why would we, list, we pay for two MLSs, right? So some have access, some don't. So now if it's listed on NJMLS that's becoming popular but still not the most used, then I have to search both because it might be listed on one and not in the other. You see what I'm saying? <coughs> Gary, good, okay. All right, next. Next we have the cost approach. Now, when we're talking about the cost approach, we already said what cost was, right? Cost, we're talking about construction. So if we're talking about construction, um, if we're talking about construction, does this include land? Do we build land? We don't. So the cost to construct is different from land purchase. Something to keep in mind. If the cost approach is construction. So why would we use the cost approach? Well, this is mainly for appraisal of special purpose buildings like churches, schools, hospitals, and so on, public buildings. And why? Because there's not, not many sales, there's not income that's produced by these uh, types of properties. Therefore, the, there's no way to use comparables for it. And the third approach is the income approach, so it makes it also difficult if there's no income. So what can we use? Cost approach or replacement approach. So how much does it cost to substitute the building? So, oh, sorry. So the cost approach is sometimes called appraisal by summation. And what is summation? The first thing we're going to do, so adding, right, the sum of things. Summation is the sum of things, right? So the first thing we're going to do is estimate the value of the land as if it were vacant. Value of land. So land is land, separate. The next thing we're going to do, this is the important part, is we're going to estimate the, the current cost of construction, of building something similar. Okay? That's why it's cost approach. Okay? Cost. Current cost of construction. Number three, and, and we're going to talk about depreciation better in a little bit, but we're going to look at depreciation, accrued depreciation, which is loss of value, right? And then we're going to look at appreciation, which is increase of value. I know you might have gotten confused right now. I just talked about calculating loss of value and then calculating a, a, increase in value. I'll explain it all better in a second. Okay? And then we're going to add the land value to the value that we just figured out. So land value, the, the land is worth $30,000. To build, it's worth $200,000. So what's the value of this property? 230000 Simple. So there's two different ways of constructing. There's the, or reconstructing in this case. There's a reproduction cost and there's a replacement cost, okay? When you see reproduction cost, we're talking about exact duplicate. What is an exact duplicate? We're using the exact same material that was used before to build this type of property. A replacement cost is using something that's not necessarily an exact duplicate, but serves the same purpose or function. So reproduction or replacement cost. Let's say you buy a Mercedes, okay? And when you buy, it could be any car, but let's, let's talk about Mercedes. When you buy a Mercedes, you know that the maintenance for that car is gonna be expensive, correct? Okay. You know that in Mercedes, most likely you have to go to the factory or the dealer to get the parts for the Mercedes because it's a specialized car. It's not a, the generic car that, that, that we usually expect it to. Let, let's put it like that, right? So 
the reproduction cost is the factory cost. It's like going back to the original material, using the same thing that was used back then to build. The replacement cost, think about it as aftermarket. Like aftermarket parts are the parts you can go to a, uh, let's say an auto zone and say, hey, I need brakes. And they're gonna say, what car? This is the car, okay. This brand is XYZ brand. But wait, this is a Mercedes. Well, here we don't sell Mercedes parts. If you wanna to go to Mercedes, you can get the Mercedes parts, reproduction. Here we have the replacement parts. They do exactly the same so very similar function or exactly the same purpose, right? But they're a different brand. You guys understand what I'm trying to say? So a few years ago, we were using copper pipes. Now we use PEX or, or, or FLEX or PVC pipes, which are for, uh, for the water, for instance, okay? So different types of material. If you buy a building that was built with copper pipes, then guess what? The reproduction cost is if we have to rebuild this, we have to include copper pipes, how much does it cost? The replacement, which is what we're doing nowadays, is every time you need to alter the plumbing that you have, or there's an issue with plumbing, they upgrade you to the replacement, the PVC or the PEX pipes. You guys got it? So reproduction, going back to what was originally constructed, material and everything, and um, replacement is new material, new standards, going to uh, uh, update it based on that. What is gonna be the difference in price? Traditionally, reproduction will be a higher price and replacement will be a lower price. So that's what, what we're looking at. Right here, uh, Kent, Daphne, I, I will show you in a second, but there's, there's no way that I can give you an example right now. But right here, we're looking at I mean, I'm already giving you the example. Uh, we calculate land separately, then we figure out how much it costs to build, whether at reproduction or replacement, okay? So, um, again, it's just using something that does the same thing, but it's not exactly uh, the same, okay? So here we go, you have, you have examples right here. I don't go over this for a reason. I was going to show you. I don't go over for a reason, uh, Daphne, because we, you're not going to do this in the state exam. Okay? So right now it's not as important for you to go through this. Can you go through it and learn? Sure. Land valuation, the value of the land is separate from the building. Like I said before, it's worth 30000 Here it's thirty five. That's how much the land costs. How much it costs to... Uh, I'll talk about depreciation later. I, I mentioned that, that I'll talk about it later, okay? Depreciation and appreciation. So replacement cost is 127. We're gonna talk about depreciation in a second, okay? And then appreciation is how much it increased in value. All right? Now, something to remember is here, determining reproduction or replacement cost. When we're talking about reproduction or replacement cost, like I said, is based on the construction. So this is construction only. So this is not the land value. This is not depreciation or appreciation. This part determining the value or the cost, I'm sorry, is based on construction only. And there's two methods that are currently used, which is the square foot method or the unit in place method. These are the only two that are highlighted, if you guys see it. And the square foot method is very simple. In this area, properties similar to this are built at an average cost of $200 a square foot, as an example. If I have 1,000 square feet, how much does it cost to build? $200,000. You got it? So that's the square foot method. How many square feet we have? What is the average to build something similar in the area? And boom. The unit in place method is when we start getting into the individual pieces of material. So we're gonna see how much we had from sheetrock, how much we had from uh, pipes, how much we had even in material, label, overhead, all that goes into the calculation. This one is the most likely used, which is the average building. Remember, there's conformity, right? Conformity means 
almost all the properties in the area are built the same way. Same design, same square footage, same everything. So it's easier to calculate how much is going to cost to build. The unit in place method was probably the initial part of it. Before we were able to calculate the square foot method, we needed to figure out what was the cost per unit of individual building components, right? So it cost me $200,000 in, um, in sheet rock. It cost me $10,000 in wiring. It cost me $30,000 just for the foundation. So you see what I'm saying? So each individual unit or component plus labor, labor overhead and all that stuff goes into this calculation. So it's a more comprehensive calculation. Okay, those two you need to remember. Now, the much awaited question by Daphne. Okay. Where does depreciation come in? Uh, in a cost approach, real estate appraisal, depreciation refers to loss in value due to any cause, oops, sorry, loss of value due to any cause or condition that adversely affects the value of the improvement to real property. As a general rule, land does not depreciate. So uh, what are we saying here? Um, loss in value. When you build a house, let me ask you this, guys this question. So let me go to the chat. When you build a house, thanks, Gil. Not there yet, but thank you. Uh, when we build a house, guys, is it going to last forever? If we don't do anything, like let's say we just do g generic maintenance, like we clean, we paint, let's say, uh, is it going to last forever? You guys saying no? Why are you saying no? When I buy a house, I want it to last forever. I don't want to replace anything. The cost that I paid for it should last forever. But no. No. Over time, something needs to be upgraded. Some, something needs to be maintained, like roof, siding, plumbing. Absolutely. It'll last a while. So guys, they've determined, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow, they've determined that a building loses value in terms of maintenance, in terms of structure. There's an increase in value in terms of demand for the market value, but the building itself loses value. So let's think about depreciation. You just got a car at the dealer, right? Brand new, zero miles. You get into that car, right? You get the keys, turn on the car. You just lost $5,000 as soon as you start driving it. Okay, so you depreciated the car, it lost value. Why? Because it's no, it's no longer a new item, it's a used item. Okay, so you started using, so it starts deteriorating, it starts having wear and tear. You guys understand? So that's what in the, in the house, depreciation is the loss of value because of that wear and tear, because now you're using it. If it's brand new and you don't touch it, now it's supposed to last forever, except for weather conditions on the exterior, correct? But once you start using it, wear and tear, it depreciates, it loses value. Absolutely, guys. Countertops, flooring, walls, carpet. We talked about the roof, right? All this eventually needs to be replaced. And again, tomorrow we're going to talk about residential depreciation is 27 years. So they, they estimated an average that the whole house somehow is going to need to be replaced in 27 years on average. So it's either going to be the siding or you're going to upgrade the, the kitchen or you're going to uh, put a new roof, whatever it is. But some type of maintenance is going to have to be done to everything in the house within those 27 years. All right. Hope that spaghetti is good. Next. Um, <laughs> um, so Land does not depreciate because land is land is just there. There's no improvements to it. Now, for appraisal purposes, as opposed to um, tax purposes, depreciation is divided into three classes. We have physical deterioration. 
Now, what is physical deterioration? We just talked about wear and tear, physical. So when you look at the question in the state exam, look for damages in the state exam. Wear and tear, look for damages. It could be curable deterioration, right? Curable means you can maintain it. That means that the repairs are economically feasible and will result in an increase in appraised value, like maintenance, painting, and so on, right? So that's curable. It's easy. It's affordable. But it might be incurable. For something to be incurable, that means it's not worth the money that you're going to spend. So it does not justify the repairs required. Okay? Have you ever had a car where you look at it and like, I have to spend $3,000 in this car? The car is worth five. Might as well use the $3,000 and the car as a down payment for a newer one. Does that make sense? So that means it's incurable. It just doesn't justify the repairs. All right? So I know I compare a lot to cars. It's just maybe it's an easier concept to, uh, to get. Then there's functional obsolescence. So when you look at functional, we're talking about usability, something that you can use or not. So if you guys remember, most cars have um, the, we'll go back to cars, they have the, the lighter, right? But do we use the lighter anymore? We now use it as chargers, right? As a, a electrical path to charge your, uh, your cell phones or whatever it might be that you're charging. We don't use it as a lighter anymore in the car. There's no more of those. So they repurposed the same plug in the car. They repurposed for something else. You guys understand? So in the house, it's the same thing. We have outmoded fixtures like plumbing. We can, we still need the plumbing, but we can use it for, uh, we can replace it or we can repurpose a room function. Like for instance, a bedroom right next to a kitchen, we might not need the bedroom, convert it to a family room, repurpose it. That's curable. You guys got it? Okay. What's incurable Gil, I'll go to that one in a second. What's incurable is that there's nothing you can do about it. Like an office building right here. This is incurable. An office building that cannot be air conditioned suffers from functional obsolescence, right? We cannot put an air condition here. It's difficult to do it, right? It's not worth it. So it's suffering from a functional. There's no way to do it. There's no way to redirect it. It's not damaged. We just cannot... Uh, alter it. Does that make sense? See here, I told you to look for damages in physical. Functional, there's nothing I can do. Okay? Alright, th this, this is terrible. Where's uh, Joe? Alright. Wow. I don't know which one is worse here. Uh, the fact that um, my agent is calling my student and says to my students, tell Bruno to hold on, right? Or the fact that Heather says, Chad suffers from functional obsolescence. Anyway. And here, Gil, I, I need you to help me out here. Sorry. One bathroom for four family with no handrails? Why would you need, is there a difference if it's for a three family and we put handrails? Or is it the bathroom needs the handrails just because? Oh, the, the, okay, those are, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Trying to see if you have more than one person, handrails. They may be holding on to it before <laughs> they go to the bathroom, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, Joe, I'm sorry. Tell Mac he has to wait. Okay. Heather says no upgrade available. Sorry, Chad. He is upgrading. He's taking this course. Right? It's an upgrade. Right, Chad? Tell her. Tell her. There you go. Daphne, can you explain incurable for physical deterioration? Um, so it was what I was telling you, the, the damage to the house is so much that it's not worth fixing. So remember the car? 
uh, the car that's uh, you need to replace the transmission is three thousand dollars, but the car is worth five. So the car is damaged. Physical means damaged. Transmission not working. Done. Three thousand dollars, but the car is worth five. Would you replace the transmission or use that money towards a new car? All right. So that's what uh, physical deterioration will be. It's it's incurable in the in this sense. It's just not worth the expense. Okay. You got it. All right, the next one is external obsolescence. External obsolescence. Uh, yeah, foundation issues as well. It's very difficult to, to fix foundational issues. Uh, external obsolescence. External is also known as economic or locational. So here's what we got. External obsolescence or deterioration or depreciation is because of something that's outside of your property okay external obviously outside of your property and because it's beyond your property it's almost always incurable you need to remember these two words external or economic either or just remember almost always incurable so in the state exam, always look for something that's outside of your property. If they're asking you about external or if they're asking you about economic obsolescence, those are the two words they use, either external or economic. Always look for something outside of your property. Like if you're next to a train station, um, or Gil just put a few here as well in the chat. But if you're next to a train station, like right now I have uh, the railroad tracks right here next to me, sometimes we're going to hear noise. That noise is from the train. Can I just move the train station? I can't. It's beyond my property. I cannot do anything. Can I move my property? Can I move the building somewhere else? I can't either. So I suffer from external or locational obsolescence because it's right there and I cannot do anything about it. You guys got it? So external, economic, or locational, the same thing almost always incurable there's nothing you can do about it the other two there's usually something you can do about it if it's feasible economically feasible right so you can fix the problem with the house or you can change the function in the house okay like we, we just helped somebody uh put an offer <laughs> yeah gary you get used to this out i just helped somebody put an offer on a for family here in newark it's a two bedroom in one unit, two bedroom in the other unit, and then one bedroom and then one bedroom uh, in the other two units. And they were not looking at it properly because of this. There was in the, the two bedroom units, there was only one living room. In the one bedroom units, there's a living room and a dining room. So I told the buyer, why are you stressing so much? The one bedrooms convert to two bedrooms and they're like, how? Well, if the two units on top are using two bedrooms, one living room, eliminate the living room or the dining room downstairs. You just gain a bedroom. Simple as that. You just almost doubled your rent based on the current rents. You almost doubled your rent roll just because of that. Now you have a four family, two bedroom, one bath in each. I just increased value by making one change I reverse this change pretty much whatever it says here it increases value you guys got it so these are things that are easy to do okay um, Daphne, what does obsolescence mean? Um, let's, let's call it obstacle. Okay, let's call it obstacle. Something that's, that's um, stopping you from having the best value on your property. So in this case, external obsolescence, it's affecting the value of your property. Okay, so next. 
Well, apparently that person is watching, probably on YouTube, be because I just got a... Yep, you're talking about me type of thing. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, yep. And I got a thumbs up, so that's what it is. All right, so... But it's, it's the cool things that we can see, uh, guys. You have to have, just like... Uh, Heather just wrote, people often cannot see beyond what's physically there, no imagination. Sometimes it's not there. It's, uh, sometimes it's like, it's. you guys need to understand, everything that I try to teach you guys here, it also goes beyond what the book says because it's a real life application. And you guys need to remember, you are the professionals. When somebody goes buy a property, and, and I'll tell you this, when you buy your own property, if you haven't yet, even though you're licensed, you're blind. You're as blind as the first time buyer that's not licensed. You don't have the vision or, or maybe you have too much vision for the property you have. Sometimes it happens as well where you can dream of things you can do with a property, but then you can't because of maybe town restrictions, for instance. In this case, there's no way to be a restriction in the four family. If two of the units are used as a two bedroom, then obviously the other two could be also converted to a two bedroom. There's no restriction there. Okay. Unless it was physically impossible to do so based on size of the rooms or layout of the rooms okay so again things to remember obsolence is like an obstacle something that stops you from having the full value of the property um natalie so uh, an external obsolence could be a landfill absolutely again external so addressing vanessa as well external is beyond your property it's not, not on the subject property. Beyond your property. We'll go with that, Joseph. Beyond your control. You guys good? All right. Here, this is just repeating the same thing we saw before. And let's see, do I have time for this? All right, so just give me one second. I'm just trying to see if we're gonna have time to do this, uh, this part or not without me rushing because I, I need you to pay attention to this. There's math involved and all that. Um, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna end the class for today. I'm gonna do this one tomorrow, the income approach. What I want you guys to do, if you have a chance for the next half hour, right? So you're gonna have a preview of the income approach. There's a video on YouTube about the income approach. So I want you to preview it because it explains the math, not all this, but explains the math uh, portion of it, okay? So that's my homework for you guys. We will end early, but I want you to go over that video so that tomorrow when I go over this, you'll be a lot faster, okay? Is that a deal, guys? Give me a thumbs up. Great. All right, meanwhile, if anybody has questions, I'm still here, but we are, <laughs> Steven. Um, where's Carlos? Carlos, you got to do it too. Anyway, so th this is how they were communicating right in the beginning of the class. They're going like this. I don't know. It's the sign language between father and son. I don't know. So um, what's the name of the video? Uh, it is Income Approach. So just go on my uh, YouTube channel, New Direction School YouTube channel, and search Income Approach. Uh, so yes, you have to type income approach or go directly on the student portal. There's a link directly to the, um, to the channel and then just, just look at the videos there. But if you search income approach, new direction school, or just new direction, uh, it should pop up. Okay. And subscribe. Thank you, Nina. Perfect. Like and subscribe. There you go. Or just get Steven to share with you guys. There you go. That's the link.
Any questions? I'll see you here. Good night to everybody else. Ha! That's right, Heather. He was faster than you today. That's because he was having that uh, <laughs> that uh, non-alcoholic drink. So he's not accelerated at all. <laughs> Good night, guys. If you have questions, I'm here. No questions. I'll see you tomorrow. I don't see question marks coming through. Good night, guys. Good night, good night, good night. Uh, absolutely. Hold on. Let me just open it up. Carlos, can you see this? Can you see it? So on the phone, if you're on the phone, you have to scroll all the way down. If you're on the computer, it should be side by side as it is here. All right, so when you click access, you have to click on it, access to course resources. It opens this on the right hand side or all the way at the bottom. And then it says access to our resources. More will be added soon. So we're, I'm constantly adding. And if you scroll down, it says Quizlet, past videos on the YouTube channel. This is where you want to go. It takes you straight to the YouTube channel. Um, Sonia, if you're still watching, then it shows this. Test yourself. That's for the practice exam. So, um, Carlos, are you there? Did you get this? Okay. So that's where you would get the videos, the live classes, right underneath it, test yourselves. But only if you, as it says, did you complete 90% of the course at least, then you do it, okay? All right, good night guys, good night. Uh, Carlos, where to set up the test? So it's also here. Shows you how. Once you pass the school, um, the school test, the school exam, I'll enter you into PSI systems, and you come here. There's a video explaining how to schedule uh, the exam. All right. Good night, Mina. Thank you. Let's see. I missed the first day. I think day five. Do I need to attend the morning class next week? So you're entitled to miss two days. So if you don't, if you don't miss anything else, you're good. Okay. Just review the uh, the videos for those days, and you should be good. Especially because you also did it before, so you should be good. Wow, Daphne left. It's a miracle. Like, no questions. I, usually I stay with her without answering questions to everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Gil. Um, all right, guys. So, Meredith, three days. Yes, you can definitely, Meredith, you can do definitely the morning class. Um, you've been, I'll tell you this, I know we're still live, but you missed the not only the first three days, you also, in the first couple of days, you were little distracted so I want to make sure you um, you are paying attention and test yourself okay very very important go here uh, to the site and test yourself okay very very important do the quizlets do the tests uh, Rhea can probably help you out if you guys are working together on that so definitely 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 um, try to use the resources as much as you can okay and she says that I'm freezing it's actually a little hot here. <laughs> All right. Any other question, guys? All right. So if there's no question, guys, I'll see you tomorrow at 5:30. If you have questions, just shoot me in the in the WhatsApp group, and I'll answer those. Thank you. Good night. Yes, Meredith, enjoy.